So this is lecture five. Lecture five is about Isaac Newton and the translation, the translation I guess, in how I see it from this sort of historical astronomy and sort of the ancient kind of proto-science, proto-scientists leading up to the modern era and really into sort of the modern scientific method. And I've chosen Isaac Newton to sort of focus on here because he really does represent a turning point in how people began to think about the world, specifically to quantify the world and be able to make precise predictions. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll, you'll understand what I'm trying to say about this. So specifically, notice that I've called this Isaac Newton and the Newtonian age. And I would, I would argue that today we are living in a Newtonian age and that all of us really look at the world and think of the world in the way that Isaac Newton first thought of the world. And part of understanding this is to try to get a sense of the way people thought about things prior to Isaac Newton or, or the world that he grew up in, what it was like, and how differently people thought about things than I think most of us think about the world today. So just a little bit of an overview. Isaac Newton was born in the year 1642. That's the same year that Galileo Galilei died. Um, the world he was born into, I think in many ways, was a world that was ruled by mysticism. Belief in astrology was very common. Uh, people didn't really fully think of the world as cause and effect. Um, at this time, for example, philosophy and science were the similar thing. So people were, so Newton was called or called himself a natural philosopher. And there was sort of this blurry line between people who were scientists and philosophers, whereas today there's a pretty sharp division between people doing philosophy and people doing science. It doesn't mean philosophy, you know, one is better than the other, but they are, are really considered different things. But at this time, they really weren't sharply divided. Um, Importantly, and I'll return to this later, the world was generally not regarded as solvable. Where I think today a lot of us think that it is. So sometimes when something funny happens, your answer, you, you will often say, well, why did that happen? What's the reason for that? Or can we predict what's going to happen in the future? Like, we think it's reasonable that we would know it's going to rain tomorrow. We can predict that. When Isaac Newton was born, people didn't really think that way. I mean, you could sort of try to read the signs and it looks like there's going to be a storm tomorrow, but you know, it was really sort of guessing and it was uh, you know, mixed in with sort of almost folklore. Whereas today we think about things differently than that. Uh, by the time of his death, he would have done some pretty amazing things. So he would have answered a number of ancient philosophical questions associated with, for example, the nature of light. Um, and more specifically, motion and time. So today I'm going to talk about a lot about what Isaac Newton did in the context of motion and thinking about time. I'll return later to this question of what is light because that's going to be a major focus of, of what we're going to be talking about later in the course. Um, he invented the, mathemat the mathematics of calculus. He was really the first person to do calculus. Uh, Leibniz is another person who sort of co-invented calculus with Newton slightly later than Newton, but did some other original things. And so Leibniz and Newton are generally credited as co-inventors of calculus. And Newton, uh, at some level, they were rivals uh, on who actually invented this, did this thing first. He discovered the law of gravity. Uh, he framed the law of gravity in mathematical terms, and in doing so, he explained the motions of the planets around the sun, the motions of the moon, provided an understanding of, for example, the tides, and explained Kepler's laws, and did all these things in the context of the law of gravity that he derived. In addition to all of this stuff, he found time to invent a new kind of telescope, a Newtonian telescope. Uh, he studied theology. A lot of his writings were, were on theology. He was also an alchemist and a chemist. 
among a lot of a few other things. He ended up being like he he directed the Mint uh, when he was older, all this kind of stuff. So he's a pretty uh, impressive guy. Uh, so let's back up a little bit again. So I want to talk uh, again about what the world was like when he was young. And so I, I talked a bit about that, but so for example, if you were to say something about the word gravity, okay, if you were in Europe in, in England and you would use the word gravity, okay, what would you think? What would people think? Well, it wasn't a force that pulled down on you. Did, that concept didn't exist. People didn't use the word gravity that way. So gravity was like the gravity of a situation. It was like a solemn mood. People thought things like, well, light things and heavy things separate naturally, right? So why, why do we fall down, okay? So if I ask you, you know, why did you fall down? A lot of people say, well, that's because gravity pulled me down. There's probably a lot of people in this room, if I say, do you feel the force of gravity on you right now? There's probably a lot of people say, yeah, that's what's, I feel it holding me down, right? But at this time, nobody was feeling the force of gravity. Another thing is, and this is, this is another important thing to think about, is time itself was really hard to measure at the time, right? People didn't have watches, okay, there weren't clocks on the walls everywhere. They had like sundials and water clocks and the ability to measure things precisely in seconds and well, you know, framed days and hours and seconds, that just didn't happen. So, and what Newton would eventually tackle is a concept of not only velocity, but acceleration and changes in motion. In a world where the, even the concept of time was nebulous compared to the way we think about time today. The concept of motion itself was really not well defined. So for example, Aristotle, who was considered, even at this time, the authority on all things, really, in the natural sciences, uh, he said things in motion include an apple ripening, a dog running, a child growing, a top spinning. So this was motion. So in order to appreciate what Newton would accomplish in his life, you have to appreciate where he was starting from. And it makes it all the more amazing what he was able to do. A lot of the terms we use in sort of common language today, we basically owe to Newton. The term mass, action, reaction, momentum, inertia, to feel the force of gravity, all of those things that we talk about sort of casually today, all come from the way he thought about the world. And, and the way he framed problems. Um, he quantified the world in a very important way, and I'll return to that later. Like I said, he invented calculus, and he made us all Newtonians. Okay? We believe the universe is solvable. We, expli we seek explanations for phenomena, trends like the weather, society. Some people think you can even predict what the stock market's going to do. Okay? These are this kind of idea would be foreign to people living before the time of Newton. Yeah? Did people back then accept his like, terms and concepts, or is it kind of like just mysterious? Or, like, uh, ask the question again. I didn't quite understand. Did people like, accept his terms and concepts? Like, or is it kind oh, of OK. When he, when he started talking about this stuff, did people accept them and, and take them seriously? Yeah, he, in his lifetime, he had a profound influence on the way people thought about things. So he was influential in his lifetime. And he had correspondence with leading intellectual figures at that time, and he did shape the world. Um, he was a little quiet about what he did at first and a little less influential than he probably could have been. But by the time he died, he had, he had a, a really strong influence on the way people thought about things, especially in England. Okay? In France, he hadn't quite uh, influenced that intellectual sphere yet, but eventually it would propagate through Europe and then through the rest of the world. Um, okay. Another thing that's important to keep in mind, and, and this has to do with the sort of availability of books and um, just general knowledge, right? I mean, at this time, for example, most of the mathematical truths that people had to discover over history had been forgotten and then rediscovered again 
There were fragments of important mathematical works that did survive, like Euclid's Elements was something that most people read. Uh, many educated people read over the course of history. But a lot of mathematical truths that would have been discovered in one civilization would have then had to have been rediscovered in another civilization and then lost because books were burned and stuff like that. And so it was sort of a very inefficient way if you think about sort of, you know, the human race, right? It was very inefficient because someone would do something first and then that idea would get lost and then someone else would rediscover it, right? Um, and so sort of because of these kind of ideas, uh, it was still possible for one person to pretty much comprehend all of human knowledge or, or come close to that. I mean, today that's impossible because everything that anyone does is sort of documented multiple times and it's, you know, it's going to be, but, but, at the, but at that time it was not like that. Um, so as a youth, effectively what Newton did is he more or less rediscovered most of the mathematics of antiquity himself. Uh, and that's not entirely true, that's overstating it a little bit. But to a large extent, he rediscovered a lot of things and then went on to invent calculus to help him understand motion. So his real passion, especially as a young person, was understanding motion and how to quantify it. And calculus is the mathematics of motion. So I, you know, the, the history of Newton is, so he had kind of a tough childhood. His father died when he, was, um, when he was pretty young. And he ended up growing up around the area where he was born. And he was sort of picked on as a kid because he, he was a weird guy and he was a weird kid. And he got picked on as a kid, sort of had a tough life. But, and, he, and he wasn't very wealthy. But because he showed so much ability and promise in mathematics, he eventually got effectively a scholarship to go to Cambridge. He went to college. Um, now, so he entered Cambridge in June of 1661. Uh, he was part of Trinity College at Cambridge. And if you go today to Trinity College, they are constantly talking about the fact that Newton went to Trinity. It's like a big deal there. Um, so the curriculum was kind of funny. So it's sort of like, it's actually like this today still at Cambridge. So it's not like this where like you take a class and then you take exam at the end of that class and it's sort of structured that way. You really have a tutor and you can sit in on classes and then you take kind of one final exam at the end to sort of for all your courses. And that sort of, sort of uh, medieval legacy is still there actually uh, if you go to college there. Um, but the curriculum at the time, uh, was such that Aristotle was basically the single authority on all of science. And you were just supposed to study Aristotle. Okay, so he was the authority of logic, ethics, rhetoric, cosmology, mechanics. You just read the works of Aristotle and regurgitated them. Um, now, Newton basically studied on his own. The way it works there is you get hooked up with a tutor and the tutor is someone who sort of mentors you on all things. But his tutor was actually a linguist and not a physicist or a scientist or a mathematician, so he was kind of worthless for him. And so he basically just studied entirely on his own. <clears throat> um, he did have access to a library, and he did, because he was at Cambridge, he was exposed to, for example, the works of Galileo and other people like Descartes. And so uh, he was influenced by ideas that were percolating around at the time. He was so poor and it was so expensive, paper was so expensive for him that he developed his own kind of weird shorthand so he could take notes and then not take up very much paper when he wrote. So he studied Aristotle. This was the authority on all things, sort of uh, all physics. Uh, and like I said this before, motion included pushing, pulling, carrying, twirling, combing, separating, waxing, and waiting. His idea was light things rose up, heavy things fell, and that's how you understand why things fall. So you can see here that this all-embracing idea of motion didn't allow for very much difference between things like velocity and acceleration. And this would be key to really understanding motion. So we all sort of have a qualitative sense of what velocity is, it's sort of going going at a constant speed, and then when you accelerate, it's, you know, you push on the accelerator in the car and you start speeding up towards higher velocity. So velocity is the change, so we now understand basically because of Newton, velocity is the, the rate of change of distance per time, right? Miles per hour. 
the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity per time. So it's miles per hour per hour. But that concept, that sort of kind of, that very sort of quantified concept certainly did not exist within the context of this sort of all-encompassing idea of motion. And there was definitely no room for quantifying things with numbers. However, Newton was also influenced by Galileo. He was able to read about the works of Galileo. And I didn't talk about this last time when I talked about Galileo, but in addition to Galileo's work with the telescope, he also did very important experiments on the idea of motion. Um, and what Galileo realized was that all bodies, when you drop them, they all fall at the same rate. Okay, so, you know, there's a famous experiment that, you know, he imag imagined a situation where you had um, a bowling ball and a uh, tennis ball. And you're standing on something tall and you let them go, they both hit the ground at the same time. So this is, you know, maybe intuitively surprising because you sort of think, well, the bowling ball is heavier, it's going to hit the ground first, but that's not, what's ha that's not what happens. There's something interesting going on there where the rate with which they fall seems to be independent of their, what they're made of. And also, the fact that they're falling at the same rate isn't the same as they're moving at the same speed. Okay, so if you take a bowling ball and you drop it from this height onto your foot, it's going to hurt, but it probably won't break it. But if you take it up over your head and drop it on your foot, then it's probably going to break your foot, right? What's happening is it's having a longer time to speed up as it hits your foot. And the idea is that it's accelerating at, the const at a constant rate. It's not moving at a constant velocity, but its acceleration is constant. Okay. So what Galileo did is he created this concept of uniform acceleration. And this idea explicitly defied the, the teachings of Aristotle and the thoughts of Aristotle. What Newton, you know, Newton read about this and he began to ask, how and why does something's velocity change? So I understand that something has an acceleration, which means its velocity is changing. But he began to think, well, why is its velocity changing? What drives something's velocity to change? Are there any questions about this? So three years after he entered Cambridge, there was a plague. It's a famous plague in 1664. And Cambridge, the colleges of Cambridge, were all shut down and evacuated. People didn't understand fundamentally what caused the plague, but they knew that if you were hanging around sick people, you were more likely to get sick. And so they basically said, we're just, we're just going to shut the whole thing down and scatter off to the countryside because you don't want to be around each other when this is going on. Um, this, was a, this was a big deal. Eventually, uh, this plague would kill one out of every six people in London. So it was a pretty crazy academic, ep epidemic. I mean, imagine something like that, right? It was sort of a catastrophic thing. So what Newton did is he went back to his, his home. And what he did is he built himself a small study. And he had a few books that he took with him. And he pretty much isolated himself and began reading and taking notes and doing his own research and trying to solve some of these problems that he had been exposed to and started wondering about when he was in Cambridge. Now he didn't really have anything to do but study and work on these things. I don't really know exactly how he supported himself to do that. Uh, I'm sure there's an answer, I just don't know. But somehow his family situation was such that he didn't have to like go home and work. They, they let him, you know, he was able to, to focus on his studies. So this period of isolation during the plague would actually turn out to be extremely fruitful and important. This would end up being the most productive year or, or period of time in his life where he just had this focused uh, attempt to solve these problems. So he was reading books that we've even talked about before. He read Euclid's Elements. So this is the same important book where Euclid sort of summarized what an ellipse was, for example. I talked about that. So he read these classic books 
that had been passed down. He read the work of Descartes and other things. He began thinking a lot about the concept of an infinity and infinitesimals, so things that are really, really small, and how you add up things that are really, really small to create continuous motion. Um, his goal was to resolve the problem of motion. He wrote that at the top of one of his workbooks. And uh, in order to do this, it turns out, he had to invent an entirely new class of mathematics. And that class of mathematics is something today that we call calculus. So he invented calculus to help him solve this problem of motion. So let me talk a little bit about cal who has taken calculus. Oh, okay. So who has not taken calculus? Okay. So for those of you who have taken calculus, what is calculus? Raise your hand if you want to answer that. Yeah. So as a joke, it's like you can finish a calculus problem and then have no idea what you've just done, right? So it's not clear. <laughs> a lot of people have taken calculus. They don't even know what. All right. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. I'll tell you how I would define what calculus is. Um, Calculus is the mathematics of motion and change. So it's the mathematics that allow us to quantify and understand motion and change. It allows us to deal with infinitesimals and infinities. That's what I talked about before, things that are really, really small. And adding up lots and lots of things that are very small and coming up with a finite answer. It keeps tracks of things like areas under curves and slopes of lines. And at its heart is this realization that the slope of a line, determining the slope of a curved line at any particular point, is the exact opposite operation of determining the area under that curve within a small infinitesimal point. So it's sort of like the, you determine the area of a small rectangle by taking how tall it is and multiplying by how wide it is. Well, you define a slope of something by taking how tall something is and dividing by how wide it is. So that's sort of the opposite of determining an area. And doing that lots of different times over and over again is basically the fundamental theorem of calculus, that integration and differentiation are the opposites of each other. Take the derivative of an integral and you get the function back again. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not going to test you over calculus, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what that is. I think it's important to realize, though, that the development of calculus, I think it's safe to say, was the single most important event in the history of mathematics for driving the rise of modern science, particularly physics and engineering. Calculus lies at the heart of that. Let me just give you an example, sort of pictorially, of what calculus is doing. Imagine you have a ball, and you want to understand what happens to its motion as you start the ball, you throw it up in the air, it goes up, it stops, and it comes back down, right? You throw a ball straight up, it comes back down. Now, it's moving fast when you first throw it up, but then what happens to its speed as it gets towards the top? It slows down. And at some point, it stops completely, so its speed is zero. And then it turns around and it starts speeding up downward again. And by the time it hits your hand, it hits your hand basically with the same speed it had when you threw it up. So that motion is actually plotted here. What's plotted is the distance up versus the time since you threw it up. If you start throwing it, okay, and at some point it stops and turns around and comes back down again. Now, if you want to understand what the velocity of that ball is, it turns out, the velocity of the ball is the instantaneous change of the distance. Oh, I wrote this wrong. I will fix it in the notes. I'm so sorry. This says dv dt. It should say d, d dt, d distance d time. I'll fix it. Sorry. Um, this is the derivative of the distance divided by the time. It's just the slope of this line. So don't even worry about what this says. The slope of this line says, how far up are we going in a given amount of time at just this point? So the slope of this line is the speed. And let's just pretend it's three meters a second. 
Had the line been here, right, if I would have done it closer to the time the ball left the hand, the line would be steeper and therefore it would be moving faster. So it's covering, it's going up more at a given amount of time. All right? Now, when it gets here, at the very top of its trajectory, what's its speed? Zero. Okay, so the slope should be zero, and in fact, the slope is zero there. It's just the tangent to that line. So you just draw a line that intersects at one point, right at that point. The tangent of that line, it still says V, because I just messed up, but it should, but it's basically zero. Okay? The slope of that line is zero, it's stopped going up. Now it's going to start going down again. Now when it starts going down, everything's the same except now all the velocities are going to be negative because now they're going down. They were going up, now they're going down, and now the velocities are negative, right? So the slope of this line is negative because if you go to a positive t, you have to go down in y. Okay, so this is a negative velocity. Does that make sense? So calculus is basically the branch of mathematics that allows you to quantify things like what the speed of, of a trajectory is over time. Is there questions about this? Does that seem familiar to people who've taken calculus? Hopefully. Okay. So this is basically the idea, and by being able to calculate these kind of things, suddenly Newton then began to think about, well, how can I test my ideas about how motion should change, why things should have a given acceleration, etc. Notice that because the velocity is changing, that means it's accelerating because the change in velocity per unit time is acceleration. So you've thrown the ball up, it's slowed down, so it's decelerating, and then when it comes back down, it's accelerating down. So by quantifying the changes in the slopes of the lines again, he can start talking about acceleration. Okay. Let me try to motivate another sort of reason why understanding infinitesimals and infinities is kind of an interesting intellectual problem that has challenged people for a long time. And one example of this are these famous set of paradoxes proposed by a philosopher named Zeno. So they're called Zeno's paradoxes. So Zeno was a philosopher living roughly 480 BC, a long time ago, one of these famous Greek philosophers. And he proposed a series of paradoxes to convince people that the very concept of change and motion were an illusion, and nothing in the world changed, and in fact, nothing was ever in motion. Let me give you an example of this, the kind of argument he made. He said, look, you may think that you walk somewhere. You may think that you could walk across this room, but I'm here to tell you that you could never walk across this room. It's impossible. And let me tell you why. Because in order to walk across the room, I first have to walk halfway across the room. But in order to walk halfway across the room, I have to first walk halfway to that point. But in order to get to that point, I have to walk halfway to that point. Therefore, there are an infinite number of regressive steps you have to take in order to get anywhere. Because I can always divide it in two. So you have to do an infinity number of things to go anywhere, and therefore you'll never get anywhere. And this idea has been debated, was debated a lot. Like, what, what's wrong with this? Does anyone have an answer for me? You're all convinced, so we're all brains in jars, we actually aren't traveling at all. <laughs> Let me give you some specific paradox, a lot of them have names, they sort of go like that. So one of the famous paradoxes that he had was called Achilles and the tortoise, okay? So you have the swift Achilles, who's racing the tortoise, so clearly Achilles is going to win the race. But he says no, in a race, even the quickest runner can never overtake the slowest, if the slowest has a head start. So let's give the tortoise a head start and say go. Achilles will never catch the tortoise. The reason why is that in order to overtake the tortoise, Achilles first has to run to the place the tortoise started at. But by the time he gets to the place the tortoise started, the tortoise has moved a little bit. So then he has to get to the point where the tortoise was 
And by that time, the tortoise has moved a little bit. So he will never, ever catch the tortoise. Because he, it, it will take infinity number of steps for him to get there. There's a similar argument, which is basically the one I started with. It's called the dichotomy paradox. Dichotomy meaning you're always dividing by two. So it's stated that that which is the locomotion must arrive at the halfway point stage before it arrives at the goal. So if you're a horse and you want to get here, in order for go to A to B, you must first go halfway to B. But in order to get halfway to B, you have to go to quarter to B. In order to get quarter to B, you have to go to eighth of B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at infinitum. And therefore, you can never start. Because there are an infinity number of things you have to do before you get here or here or here. So how do you solve this paradox? I mean, is this, should we all be worried that we're all living in illusion? How do you solve this paradox? Any ideas? Yeah. Yes, I, I think, yeah, I think you're getting at it. So you're saying, look, in calculus, so you took calculus, and one of the nice things about calculus is it teaches you how to think about infinities in different ways. And if you have a very, very small step, you can think of how many steps you have. If the steps are small enough, it's a question of which infinity is bigger than the other. So some infinities are different than others. That's another context. Let me tell you a story. Like, it happened this weekend, and I, or it happened Monday, and... It, I wasn't planning on this at all. So my, my little daughter, who's five, comes up to me, and she's into this thing now where she's like, what's infinity times one? And I'm like, infinity, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. <laughs> what's zero times two? Like, zero, okay. And she says, what's zero times infinity? And I go, <laughs> I go, well, that's complicated. <laughs> and she says, see, you've been watching too much football, and your brain has turned to mashed potatoes. <laughs> I was like, okay, fair enough. My brain's turned to mashed potatoes. But it is a hard question. I was really proud of her for asking it. Uh, but it's a hard question. So the, hard, the reason why it's hard is, is some infinities are different. There's more than one kind of infinity. And there's more than one kind of zero. So this is a sort of a calculus kind of thing. But I think we all know the answer to this. Let's say you look at 1 over x, the quantity 1 over x, and you let x get really, really, really small. Okay, 1 over 0.1, 1 over 0.01. So 1 over 0.1 is 10, 1 over 0.01 is 100, 1 over 0.001 is, a th is sorry, it's 1 tenth, 1 one hundredth, 1 one thousandth. It starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Sorry. Let me start again. 1 over 0.1 is 10, 1 over 0.01 is 100, 1 over 0.001 is 1,000. So as x goes to 0, what is the value of 1 over x? Infinity. infinity. Right, so it's infinity. Right. So let's say a is infinity to find this way. But let's let b equal x squared and let x go to 0. What's the value of b? Come on. Zero. Yell it out. Zero. zero. Good. So if a is infinity and b is 0, I try to answer my daughter's question, what's a times b? Infinity times 0. X. What is it? X. x, but what's x? Zero. We'll walk through it. Okay. Right, so it's 1 over x times x squared. All x goes to 0, but 1 over x times x squared is x. So as x goes to 0, this is 0. So infinity a times 0b equals 0. Is that right? Does that look familiar, or are we comfortable? But let me change this infinity. 
Now let me let C equal 1 over x squared as x goes to 0. That's also infinity. But as x goes to 0, 1 over x squared goes to infinity faster than 1 over x because x is getting really small fast. So it's a different kind of infinity. Right? So I've got 1 over x here and then I'm going to keep B the same. Now what's infinity times 0? Right, it's 1. 1 over x squared times x squared is 1, so no matter what I do to x, it's always 1. So infinity c times 0b is 1. So what calculus does is it allows us to understand how some infinities are different than others, and some zeros are different than others, and we can think about how, how to compare them and add them up. And so that was the, that's the logical flaw at some level in Zeno's paradox. It's just because you have infinity number of things, if those things are small enough, it doesn't matter. So, you know, this is, this is another way of talking about Zeno's dichotomy paradox. He's talking about the distance here. We're trying to get to B. So if you have one half the distance, plus one quarter of the distance, plus one eighth the distance, plus blah, 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 it's plus one over two to the n, where n is going to infinity. The question is, what does this add up to? Does this add up to infinity? Does anyone know? What is it? No, close. One. Let me try to convince you of that very quickly. Uh, basically, see, the first term is one half plus one quarter. That's three quarters. So I just took that and turned it to three quarters. This one stays an eighth. Everything else the same. Now I do 3 quarters plus 1 eighth, that turns into 7 eighths plus everything else the same. And you can just keep doing this and convince yourself that actually what this turns into is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n where n goes to infinity. And 1 over 2 to the n as n goes to infinity is 0. So as n goes to infinity, this is 1. So this, while it's an infinite sum, the infinite sum adds up to 1, as it has to. It has to add up to 1 by just looking at this diagram. Obviously, it adds up to 1, right? Because the first distance is this distance, then you add this one, then you add this one, and you just want to get to A. So while this technically is not calculus, it's sort of the way, I mean, when you take calculus, the first thing you do is limits, right? It's the way of thinking about these things. So, this infinite sum gives a finite answer, and calculus more generally helps us sum up a series of infinitely small things to get finite, quantifiable answers and then to make sense of the world that way. Are there any questions about this? So the power of calculus is that it helps us understand how to deal with change, things like motion, acceleration, etc., in a concrete and quantifiable way. And Newton was forced to do this because he wanted to understand things like the motions of the planets and why apples fall from trees and stuff like that. And so what Newton did, building off of this sort of mathematics of calculus that he developed, was he derived a number of laws of motion that explained why things change their velocity, why things have acceleration and what happens. So, any, any, for example, uh, he said that bodies in motion tend to remain in motion. Bodies move at a constant speed unless they're acted on by an outside force. So, if you have something that's traveling and not acted by, on by any outside force, so think of a hockey puck on a really, really smooth ice rink. If you just give that hockey puck a push and it's traveling at constant speed, it will stay at that speed forever unless something hits it. This property is broadly called inertia. So if you're at rest, you want to stay at rest. If you're in motion, you want to stay in motion. The other thing he did is he said the thing that makes things accelerate, the things that makes things change their constant motion, to accelerate, to change their velocity, is applying a force on them. But specifically for a given force, you have to know the mass to figure out what the acceleration is. So to put it another way, 
if the hockey puck is more massive, you have to push on it harder to get it moving. Okay? So to accelerate a car that's heavy, it takes a lot more force than it takes to accelerate a car that's light. So big heavy cars tend to have to have really powerful engines to accelerate, right? But little cars, you can accelerate them with little engines that don't have that much force. And finally, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what this means is that if I push on the wall, it pushes back at me. Okay, I'm gonna push on the wall, it's gonna push back at me. So everything, every time there's a force on something, you get pushed back. So if you're on this ice rink again, right, and you push on the hockey puck, hockey puck, and it's smooth ice, you will go backwards. Okay, so if you've ever been ice skating with a friend and you push your friend, you will go back. Okay, questions about that? Now, starting with these ideas about why do things move, why do things accelerate, why do things change their motion, in the back of his mind he's thinking about the planets going around the sun. Their motion is changing, right? They're going in ellipses. What is making their motion change? Because he said if there's no forces on these planets, they'll just keep going on straight forever. They won't be looping back. But something is making these things turn back on themselves. And the story goes that he was out in his yard, sitting under an apple tree, and an apple fell. And he thought, well, why did that apple fall? There must be a force tugging on that apple to make it fall to the ground. Is it possible that that's exactly the same force that's tugging on the moon to make it go around the Earth? Is it possible that that's exactly the same force that's tugging on the Earth to make it go around the sun? Could it be that the same laws, the same mathematical laws that govern simple things like why you fall down when you trip or why apple trees fall from trees, Apples fall from trees. <laughs> uh, exactly the same force, exactly the same laws that govern the motions of those heavenly bodies up there. That the same laws that operate here on Earth operate throughout the universe. Could that be true? <clears throat> he proposed that there's a force of gravity, and he worked this out to show what, what it had to be to make things work that every object in the universe attracts every other object in the universe via the force of gravity, and that force of gravity depends on the masses of the objects. So the more massive the objects are, the more they tug on each other, the stronger the force is. The other thing, though, is that the farther the objects are away from each other, the weaker the force is. And that dis it falls off like the distance squared, so things that are really far away, the force of gravity is weak. Okay, so in our day-to-day -day lives, we're much more conscious of the force of gravity of the Earth than we are the force of gravity of the Sun, even though the Sun is more massive. Because the Sun's really, really far away. So he proposed this mathematical law, and I'm, not gonna, I'm actually not going to test you on the form of this law, I just wanted to show it to you. But we can understand a lot by thinking about things this way. So, when you think about the orbits of stuff, there's this famous thing called Newton's cannon. Um, imagine you have a cannonball and you shoot it from a cannon at a speed that's not that high. So what happens is it will constantly be tugged towards the Earth and it will eventually hit the Earth because it's being tugged inward toward the Earth because of gravity. But if you launch this thing going faster, it'll go farther before it falls and hits the Earth. But if you launch it fast enough, it will actually be able to keep falling forever around and around and around. And that's what an orbit, that's what something an orbit is. It's going fast enough that it never hits the Earth. So you can ask, how does the Earth's gravity tug on the ball as it orbits? So that is, in what direction is the force of gravity as this ball goes around? <clears throat> 
The answer is it's always towards the Earth. So it's like this. It's not in the direction of motion because it's got a tendency to go straight because of its inertia and all the Earth is doing is turning it. So it wants to go straight but it's being turned. Yeah? Uh, with the same reasoning that means that the Earth has to go <coughs> the same direction around the sun but how it sometimes get farther away from the sun because it has an elliptical orbit, how does that happen? So it's, the fact that it's on an elliptical orbit, it can still be tugged toward the, towards the sun all the time. Um, it's just that, uh, let's see, one way, to think, one way to think about it is, you know how it's going faster when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's farther away? Remember that Kepler's law? That's because the force is stronger when it's close to the sun and then it's slower when it's up here. So it's sort of, it's all self-consistent. So you can, you can show that it's still self-consistent that you can drive a, a closed orbit that's stable even if it's elliptical compared to a circle. That's something I can't explain to you qualitatively, but it's something you can derive mathematically, like physics, undergraduate physics majors at the school will derive that maybe when they're a sophomore and show that the, allowed, the only allowed orbits for planets going around the sun are ellipses. So one of the really amazing things is that Newton's law of gravity demands that planets orbit in ellipses, as opposed to Kepler's laws, which sort of empirically found that they orbited in ellipses. Okay, so. Um, we are running out of time, so let me just do, I want to do one thing before we quit. Um, if the Earth got more massive, what would happen to this cannonball if it was orbiting before? Yes, the gravity would go up and it would go bump and just hit the ground. But what if the Earth got less massive and I had the same cannonball? What would happen? If it was really, really light Earth, it would just fly off and never come back. Um, I'll finish this up. There's not that many slides up. I'll finish it up next time and we'll see you on Friday.